We shall cross over armed, armed for battle. Baruch Hashem. We're going to be learning today some lessons, some life lessons as we look at the tribe of Gad and Reuben and half of Manasseh who wanted to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, however, they did in fact say that they would cross over the Jordan and fight the fight with the rest of Israel. We're going to be learning some lessons from that, see how we can apply it to our everyday lives. Glad you are here. Be sure and subscribe to our channel if you've not done so. Strike the bell so that you can stay up to date on everything that we have here uh, whenever we have videos posted. And as I always ask you to do, please take notes and be willing to put your thoughts, your insights, your takeaways from these videos in our comments. And a lot of you are doing that already, and it's really, really helpful. I enjoy reading them, and it's a blessing. Also, I want to ask you a question. How many of you are watching from outside of the United States, outside of Los Estados Unidos? And uh, maybe you also watch on Shabbat too. Perhaps you comment, perhaps you don't. We don't know. But we want to know uh, if you're watching from outside the United States because we we would like to um, honor your country by putting a flag in our sanctuary if we don't already have one there um, for your country. So, you know, you could be watching from, I don't know, Switzerland, perhaps, or uh, Russia, I don't know, or you could be watching from anywhere, for that matter. Uh, so let us know where you're watching, Argentina, Venezuela, maybe, uh, you know, that would be fantastic. So let us know if you're watching from outside the United States. And yes, Habiba, Texas, <laughs> it's funny you should mention that because Zaykin and Yigal suggest we should put a Texas flag up because Texas does in fact count for outside of the United States. It is its own republic. Well, at least we Texans think of it that way. Anyway, so uh, Baruch Hashem, glad you are here. What else? What else? Oh, today is the first of Av. So today begins the nine days of Av. Our morning uh, increases. Uh, this is where we're really not supposed to wear um, laundered clothes per se. Uh, there's some other things about it. Um, we're not, we don't eat meat or drink wine during the nine days, except for Shabbat. Shabbat is the exception. There's no morning on Shabbat at all. So uh, during the nine days, we're not supposed to bathe. Now, somebody had a good question about that. Let me go ahead and, and answer that now. Um, Hey, by the way, somebody's watching from, from Kenya. We have a Kenyan flag up, actually, in our sanctuary. Um, so thank you so much for that, Baruch Hashem. Um, so anyway, uh, bathing. So someone asked me about bathing. You know, you, we can bathe for sanitation purposes. Uh, you know, rinse off the uh, sweat and grime and so on. But the, the bathing that's talked about in Halakha is talking about, you know, bubble baths, uh, you know, uh, that type of thing. It's more luxurious bathing. Uh, so, you know, it's really, it comes back to the heart of things. Uh, just keep in mind that this is a, a particular time of, uh, of mourning these last nine days of Av. And also in the, in the notes or the description rather of this video, I have a link to the video I did last year on the month of Av. And so, It'd be important, of course, to review that and to think about the um, the mazel uh, of the month. Something that, speaking of the mazel of the month, something the Rebbe Zim was saying earlier this morning uh, to me was that, you know, the mazel of uh, of Av is is the lion, and uh, the it talks about in in some of the Jewish literature that the temple was destroyed by a, a lion, as it were spiritually speaking, of course. Um, and then the Jewish idea is that the Messiah was born uh, on, uh, the Messiah was born on Tisha B'Av, which is the ninth of Av. Now, we know, in fact, that the Messiah was, in fact, born in Tishrei, uh, the month of Tishrei. So what does it mean when Jewish uh, uh, sages say the Mashiach was be born? Well, it's because the temple was destroyed on the, both temples, actually, were destroyed on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. And the, the Jewish idea is that Messiah is going to come and uh, rebuild, as it were, uh, reestablish the temple on the ninth, ninth of Av. 
Uh, and so th thus, therefore, transforming this day, which has been a day of tragedy throughout Jewish history, uh, and transforming it into a day of immense jo uh, joy. Well, what that means uh, practically is, is that uh, the temple is essentially synonymous with the rabbi, I mean, with the rabbi, excuse me, with the Messiah. So think about it. If the, if the Messiah was born on the ninth of Ah, but really what we're talking about is the, the rebirth of the temple, that's ultimately what we're talking about, then it means that the Mashiach is synonymous with the, with the Beis HaMikdash. Which is exactly what Yeshua said. Okay. Interestingly enough, now I don't want to get off on this topic. It is fascinating. One of these days you should, well, all of you should purchase a copy of the Encyclopedia Judaica. It's a multi-volume set. Um, it's really fascinating reading, though. I don't, I don't spend enough time reading the Encyclopedia Judaica, but it's one of those things where it's one of those those sets, right? It's like it's like it's an encyclopedia, and so it, the Encyclopedia Judaica is one of those uh, uh, volumes that uh, you know you could grab a nice pipe and uh, you know something nice to drink, and you can sit and read for like two or three hours and just get lost, and it's super fascinating, but. There is a wonderful, wonderful section in there on Shabbatai Zvi. Now, Shabbatai Zvi was a false messiah. Pretty much a nutcase. But he pretty much led the entire Jewish world. When I say the entire Jewish world, I'm talking about everybody. To believing that he was, in fact, the messiah. Only... Uh, small minuscule handful of rabbis kind of had raised eyebrows and thought that he might not be the messiah but in fact that it, they were few and far between um and what's fascinating about that is that when you read what shabbatai zvi was saying about himself and what he was proclaiming that all of judaism embraced sounds extremely like almost identical to the things that Messiah Yeshua was saying. He's the word incarnate. He's going to, you know, and all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it's really fascinating. Reading. I don't want to get off into it because too much is too long. But tying this back to the Messiah and Tishbaav, so the Messiah is going to resurrect the temple. He said, I am the temple. And therefore, except, you know, this is, he is in fact going to bring the temple with him and it's going to be on the ninth of all. But remember the, the so the Rebbe was talking about the, the temple was destroyed spiritually by a lion. Uh, and then we find that it's the lion of the tribe of Judah who is going to rebuild the temple as it were. Which brings up a fascinating concept about god and that is that god always renews heals restores with the very thing that brought destruction in the first place it's it's a phenomenon with him and therefore in our lives the very thing that was that brought us destruction, God somehow transforms that and uses that very thing to elevate us. Something that only he can do. You know, in, in our world, if you got cut with a knife, you don't use a knife to heal a knife wound. If you get cut with a knife, then you use a bandage. But Hashem somehow uses the knife, the very knife that cut us, somehow he uses that very same thing to bring the healing. It's just that it's it's an interesting concept, and it is it is a an encouragement to all of us that the very thing that you thought was going to be your death, God says that when we change our hearts, when we make teshuva, when we do our best to trans transform our, ourselves using the power of His Word, then that very thing that was to, meant to bring you death will actually bring you life. It's very interesting. So in chapter 32 of the book of Numbers, 
we have this story. And it says the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had abundant flocks, very great. They saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, it was a place for fl for flocks. Okay. Wow, Baruch Hashem. Marita had a you had a brain hemorrhage. I'm, thank God you're you're okay, Baruch Hashem. May God bring a refuah shlema. You have to tell us about that, Marita. Let us know what's happening with your miracle, Baruch Hashem. We want to give God the glory. So anyway, uh, the children of Gad, it says here, they saw that the pasture land was um, a great place for flocks. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and said to Moshe, Eliezer, the Kohen, and the leaders of the assembly saying, Adaroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, and Eliale, and Sabon, Nebo, Rebon, and the land of Hashem smote before the assemblies of Israel. In its land for flocks, and the servants ha have flocks. They said, if we have found favor in your eyes, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not bring us across the Jordan. And Moshe said to the children of Gad and the children of Reuben, shall your brothers go out to battle while you settle here? Why do you dissuade the heart of the children of Israel from crossing to the land that Hashem has given them? Thus did your fathers, when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land, they went up to the valley of Eshkel and saw the land. They dissuaded the hearts of the children of Israel not to come to land that Hashem had given them. The wrath of Hashem burned up that day, uh, burned on that day, rather. And he swore, saying, if these people who came up from Egypt from the age of 20 and up will see the ground that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for they have not followed me fully. He goes on to rebuke them, and his anger is pretty mad. He's like, look, you know, he's accusing them of betrayal. And, of course, the story goes on that they, they, they say, no, 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 we will go up. We will cross over armed. In fact, uh, I, in fact, you know, we are going to go ahead of the army. We're going to be the vanguard. So let's discuss this. Let's look at the insights. And see what's going on here. Moses is angry. They want to stay. Why do they want to stay? Why is Moses angry? What can we learn about this? What can we learn about crossing over armed ourselves? Let's see what it says. First of all, it says abundant flocks, very great. Let me open up. Let me go ahead and open up here. Rebenu Bakya. Let me put this. I don't want to lose my place, but I want to make sure that I'm sharing all the insights that I had in mind. Because some of the, they're all very interesting in our lives here. So, <clears throat> going back here to this insight, they had a lot of flocks, they had a lot of wealth. It says, At first, it may seem difficult to understand why Moses reacted so angrily against the proposal of the children of Reuben and Gad. After all, their desire to sell in a good pasture land does not seem like a very serious sin. I mean, they're just looking at the land and saying, Hey, you know, it's a good place for us to have all of our, our, our livestock. But Moses recognized that they were selfish and they had inappropriate motivation. So this is life lesson number one. We have to guard against selfishness. That is a common human problem. No one is immune to it. We are all susceptible to it. Our modern culture makes it um, even worse. You know, I, I know all of us have seen these videos where somebody is, is being attacked or being, you know, or, or in need help. And people, instead of helping, they're, they're either running away or they're videotape, or the video, videotaping it. <laughs> that shows my age. Or they're recording it on their phone or video. It's disgusting. Uh, I came across a, 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 a video uh, a day or two ago, and this it was a, you know, it's it's a it's, it's this channel that talks about self defense and things like that. I find it helpful. Typical guy stuff, probably. But anyway, it shows this woman. She gets she's getting attacked 
mugged. You know, like the guy's trying to steal her purse. And she fights with him. He shoots her in the leg. She's bleeding. He runs away. And there's a shop owner right there. It's right, happening right in front of a store. The shop owner comes out. He sticks his head out of his shop door. He sees the woman there bleeding. What's he do? He shuts and locks his door and, and pulls the little gate thing down. Crazy. Doesn't help her. Just he's trying to take care of himself, make sure he stays protected. You know, it's that kind of thing. I guess, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say is we have to learn how to not be selfish. And try to help people. And I know some of these are extreme examples. Thank God that there are people who do jump in and help, but it's becoming, that's becoming more the exception as opposed to the rule these days. It says, it says that when they said in the, in the scripture, it points out, they said that this is a good place for our sheep pens and we shall build them here for our flocks and cities for our children. And the sages point out that Moses recognized in their word that the first thing they said was they were going to build sheep pens for their flocks. Oh, and then we'll build cities for our children. So they put their priorities wrong. And that's the first insight here is they just had selfish motivations seemingly and the they put their priorities wrong. And ladies, words, ladies and gentlemen, words have meaning. And if you listen to the way we talk sometimes, You'll see our priorities in the way that we say, hey, we're going to, this is great land. We'll build herd, you know, or excuse me, we'll build, build pens and, and, and so on for our flocks. Oh, and we'll build cities for our children. It, the cities for our children should have come first. That's the first lesson. They were materialistic. And as a result, they eventually suffered consequences for this. We cannot be uh, materialistic. OK, uh, the Midrash, there's a Midrash in this from Rabbeinu Bakia brings down uh, the Gadites, by the way. There's an insight here. The Gadites were a very, very powerful tribe. I mean, they were warriors. And in fact, there is an ancient comment. And it, Rabbi, um, yes, here it is. It says. That whenever the children of Israel went to battle, um, Rashi explains that you could tell who had been slain by the tribe of Gad because whenever a, a, a member of the tribe of Gad would strike his enemy with a sword, that in one blow, he would sever both the head and both arms. So that's how you could tell who had been killed by the tribe of Gad. Now, this is all of the, the, the tribes had, had great strength and power, but Gad was just bad. They were bad. And so it talks about that even though they were going to be on the other side of the Jordan and essentially uh, segregated or separated from the rest of the tribes, they didn't, it, they didn't bother them. Because nobody goes on to say here in these comments uh, that no one would fight against Gad. No enemy would purposely want to come and fight against Gad. But it says a Midrashic approach to Konkuma Matot 5 talks about material wealth. When material wealth is received from heaven, it is liable to endure. However, if it is not received from heaven, it is unlikely to endure. There are two truly, there were two truly wealthy people in the world, it says. One was an Israelite, that was Korak, and the other was Haman. Both of them not only lost their wealth, but they perished uh, in, entirely. And the reason was is that their material wealth had not been a gift from heaven. They had acquired it by tearing it away or stealing it from other people. Uh, something that people don't really know or may not be aware of is that in Judaism, fidelity in business and fidelity in our, well, fidelity in business 
is extremely important. And in fact, the old ancient idea is, is that when a Jew gets to heaven and is going to enter into the pearly gates, so to speak, um, the concept is they're going to be asked, were, were, were you honest in your business affairs? Wealth that has been achieved through, um, through deception uh, or through other dishonest means uh, is an extremely bad sin uh, in, biblically. And so Korok and, and Haman are this way. And there's all kinds of way by the way, ways in which, by the way, you, you try to steal from someone. You try to steal their stuff, steal their life's work or whatever. Um, it goes on to say in one of the insights, this is just another life lesson for us. Uh, it, it says that they confused what was, the, the tribe of God confused what was important with, with, with what was auxiliary. And they demonstrated this when they mentioned their livestock before they mentioned their children. So God told them that people who consider their personal wealth as more important than their children would find that their wealth was not blessed. And this is what Solomon taught us in Proverbs 20 and verse 21. An inheritance gained hastily, hastily, that is sudden riches, at the outset will not be blessed in the end. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there, there's no get rich quick scheme. And a lot of people try. You remember Korok? What, what was Korok trying to do ultimately, right? Korok wanted to be uh, Moses and probably Aaron combined. He want he re, well he wanted to be Aaron ostensibly, but really what he wanted to be was Moses. Okay. But how did Moses become Moses? Well, frankly, through a lot of hard work. Moses, you know, he spent 40 years in the wilderness basically working hard. And he had to, you know, come back to Egypt and work hard to, to affect the release of his people. In other words, there was quite a bit of effort involved. It wasn't like Moses was just instantly, uh, you know, anointed. Uh, and, and had this awesome congregation, if you will. And so years later, after Moses and Aaron had been working so hard and suffering and through blood, sweat, and tears, building this community, and now he has a tabernacle, and now he has a, a, a priesthood and a Levitical, and he's got the tribes organized and everything is beautiful. All of a sudden, here comes Korah. What's Korok try to do? Does Korok want to go out and start his own congregation and work hard? No. <laughs> no. He wants to steal everything Moses and Aaron have worked for because he just wants to take it. And that's what Koroks do. We talked about Korok during the during the um uh the week of the Korok Torah portion and we talked about those people who want to usurp authority in congregations and steal the building and steal the, all the bank accounts and steal the people. Uh, and it, it, it comes down to essentially what that is, what I'm trying to say is that's essentially a get rich quick spirit concept, mindset. I don't want to work hard. And I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is, ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing it takes hard work. It takes labor. Uh, there's no such thing. Can you win the lotto? Yes. And hey, listen, I pray that I pray that God would bless you with winning the lottery. But just understand that you have to even be careful with that because sometimes, very often, if your heart's not right, it doesn't. That doesn't work out well. So there's an, also a proverb that says here, Proverb 23, 4, where it says, do not tire yourself out trying to become rich. Desist out of a feeling of insight. So don't pursue wealth. Uh, don't, per, don't be that person that 
pursues wealth like it's it's all there is in life. The, it goes on to say here that the person who is who is truly wealthy is the one who is content with what God has provided him. And in Psalm 128, 2 says, when you consume the fruit of the labors of your hand, you will be happy and feel content. So the rabbis point out that the person who is truly content is, or the truly wealthy rather, is the one who is content with what he or she has. Now listen, that does not mean that you can't desire more. It doesn't mean that you just, you know, you, you, you have to be, you can't have dreams. You can't have goals. It doesn't mean you can't have ambition. That's not what that means. But what it does mean is that you have to be content with what you have and then believe God or better yet, pray to God and to for more and work hard, do what it takes to have it. It's like my wife has always said, you know, we have to take it when it come using a, a, a let's use a vehicle as an example. You have a vehicle and you want a better one. Maybe your vehicle is a little bit of a hoopty. Boy, raise your hand out there if you've ever had a hoopty. Boy, I've had a hoopty. I've had cars that had built-in smoke screens. <laughs> like the spy vehicles, you know. Built-in smoke screens. And uh, all my have, I've had some hoopties. Now, listen, what most people do is if you have a hoopty, you have a car that's not all that great, and you you want a better car, then what they do is they they, they generally just kind of let their little car just kind of kind of go. They don't take care of it. By take care of it, I mean they don't they don't put any tender loving care, any TLC into it. They don't they don't wash it. They don't keep it clean. Whatever. And so my wife had this idea. That she learned from her um, and I believe, that no matter how poor you are, that is no excuse for being filthy because soap is cheap. So just because you're poor doesn't mean you have to be filthy. So she had this idea that if we don't take care of the vehicles that we have, then God won't bless us with something else. And so our cars generally you know, always received the proper maintenance. And more importantly, we kept them clean. We took care of them. Keep the uh, vacuums, you know, carpet vacuumed and dashboard cleaned off and kept it washed. And in other words, treated it like we appreciated it. Might have been a junker, but it was a clean, shiny junker. And guess what? Hashem blessed it. And I believe he blessed it because you're content with it. So just being, in other words, just being content with what you have doesn't mean that you won't get more or that you can't desire more, but don't chase after it. Don't lust after it. That is the point. You know, you go to poor neighborhoods and it's there's trash everywhere and it looks nasty. Why? Why? Just because you're poor, you can't pick up the trash? I don't understand that. But here's what I'm going to tell you, by the way. The reason that they're poor is because of that. See, that's the trick. So you go to a poor neighborhood and it's all trashy and everything's nasty. And you think it has to do, they don't have any money. No, that's not it. The reason that they allow it to get that way is the reason they're poor. And here's what the ancient sages said. The ancient sages said, and I, I actually wrote this down. I have it somewhere. I forget where the source is, but trust me, it's true. This is what they say. They say that filth actually attracts a spirit of poverty. Yes, you heard it here first. And cleanliness attracts a spirit of wealth. You see, we joke sometimes. We joke sometimes and say, because I keep my car clean, using the car as an example, when I because I keep my car clean, it runs better. See, we joke sometimes, but it's no joke. See, keeping your car clean attracts a spirit of prosperity. 
And the Rebbe scene just said this the other day. We were driving on the road, and she was, I, th- I think, I'm pretty sure Hadassah was with us. You know, we're trying to impart a little wisdom. I think she was trying to impart a little wisdom into her daughter. And she was pointing out that people who let their cars look all filthy and nasty, they're always have, they always seem to have car problems. Because the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that cleanliness attracts a spirit of prosperity. And this is why when you go to these poor neighborhoods and everything's nasty and all trashed out, you think, well, poor people, it's so sad that they they don't have any money. That's why their neighborhood is, 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 is gross. No, that's not it at all. The reason they don't have any money is because they allow their place to be gross. Because it doesn't cost money to be clean. So you don't have to be rich to sweep. You don't have to be wealthy to pick up your trash. What, what's a what's a what's a what's a bottle of soap cost? A dollar, right? It's laziness. I'm sorry. We're not. Is it okay to be honest? I forgot to ask. <laughs> I forgot to ask if it's okay to be honest because we live in a world that that wants to be successful despite that socialism despite a lack of despite any effort despite a lack of effort uh, is it okay to be honest i used i'm, I'm not, i wasn't sure i should have i should have asked if honesty was okay before we started <laughs> but look they're they're willing to go up armed i i guess ultimately this is the spiritual uh there's so much more to share here but there's a there's a spiritual point in, in this is that Ultimately, they tell Moses, look, look, we're not, they realize their mistake. Moses rebukes them and they realize, you know what, you're right. And here's how we're going to make this right. We are going to arm ourselves and we're going to cross over and we're going to go up armed. And not only are we going to fight the fight along with our brothers, but we're actually going to be the vanguard. We're going to go in front of them. We're going to be the first to fight. Because they realized that, you know what? They need to suit up. And what we need to do in life is we've got to suit up. Too many people in our world want things without any effort. This is the message of Christianity, if you want to be honest. This is the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity is uh, you want all the benefits without any of the responsibilities. No rules, just right. You don't serve the king of kings. You serve Burger King. You want it your way. Have it your way. You serve Burger King, not the king of kings. That's the message. Um, A pastor, we, we talked about this. People have commented. And it's true that a lot of pastors know the truth. A lot of pastors know that, that, like I said yesterday, that these uh, Easter and Christmas and and Sunday is a bunch of phony baloney plastic banana good time rock and roll. They know that. They know the history. They know that Christianity is a man made religion. They know that Constantine was a was a nut job. They know it, but they won't do anything about it because they're afraid that if they tell the truth that the people will leave and they'll lose their building and all the other stuff, maybe even their job, because they don't really trust God as their source, ultimately. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm just going to be honest with you about that. If you think about it, if you if you just think about it in logical terms, not being honest with people, so because you're afraid that if they if if you tell them the truth, they won't they won't buy from you, okay, so to speak. That's dishonest gain. That's dishonest gain. I'm selling you a product, in this case, religion, but I'm not being, I'm not telling you what I know to be true. I'm just telling you what I want you to hear because I want you to keep coming and financing the place. That's that's dishonest. And so we can't do anything about it. Those people have to be accountable to God and and whatever, but we can do something about who we are. And so we have to make sure that we're not dishonest. 
that the the product, quote unquote, that we're selling is a true product. And that begins with us ourselves. And we have to be armed for battle and be willing to cross over and do what's necessary. And put our priorities in the right place. And the tribe of Gad and the tribe of, of Reuben and half Manasseh did just that. They put their priorities right. Moses rebuked them and they said, you know, you're right. We are, in fact, going to settle here, but we need to make sure that we put our priorities in the right place. And not focus on our materialism, not focus on what we think is important, but put God first in our life. And Gad and these tribes spent seven years fighting the fight, putting in the hard work so that they could put their priorities in the right place. Well, there's a lot more we could said about this, but we're going to leave it there. That's that's the end of our Aliyah and the end of our study of the book of Numbers. We'll be back next week and begin the book of Devar and the book of Deuteronomy. Like this video, subscribe to our channel. Let me know your thoughts. Did we say anything today that was a good takeaway for you? If so, let us know. Also, click on the video for the month of Av and check that out because we need to understand what is going on in this new month uh, begins today and what Hashem, what is the takeaway that Hashem wants us to have with respect to uh, what's the mazel. So God bless all of you. May you have a great and wonderful day. And we Shabbat Shalom. And we will look forward to seeing you in the synagogue tomorrow.